Human Life at Risk by Climate Ideologues Who owns the UN? UN Secretary General Guterres misleads the public on climate change. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society and tonight I'd like to walk through a presentation discussing what Secretary General Guterres of the UN said recently that we should just completely phase out fossil fuels and let me show you how ridiculous and dangerous a statement that is. So let's go on with the presentation. These are frightening claims, and they're unsubstantiated. UN chief says fossil fuels are incompatible with human survival and calls for credible exit strategy. When in fact, if you look at life expectancy globally and by world regions since 1770, you can see it's been nothing but going up. Our life expectancy has increased, our quality of life has improved, and the places that have least improved and have the shortest uh, longevity are Africa, where poor Africans are denied fossil fuels by the West. No fossil fuels? Well, no modern medicine. Then we have to go back to kitchen table surgery. Electricity was recognized by the UK Department of Health as the most vital of all infrastructure services because without it, most other services will not function. So yeah, no fossil fuels, no electricity, no modern medicine. No fossil fuels, no fertilizer, no food production, no food delivery, no food storage. No fossil fuels, no electrical power. Of course, there are some places in the world where there's nuclear power, where there's hydro, there's a little bit of wind and solar, but this has to be backed up 100% by conventional power. So you need conventional power to run solar and wind on the grid. If you're off-grid, that's something else, but then your power will always be intermittent. Bioenergy and other renewables, well, they're not even on the table. No fossil fuels, no wind, no solar, no mining. So, mining actually consumes a huge amount of fossil fuels. So if you're going to do critical mining for the green new future, for EVs and all these other wonderful things, you're going to need a lot of fossil fuels. No electricity, that means no manufacturing, no internet, no cell phones, and no food storage. So then, unfortunately, people will be living hand to mouth like many of the people in Africa. And this is where we see that these are uh, death ratios because people are cooking over open flame using biomass, like wood, like dung. The reality is fossil fuels are life. You can see back in the 1800s, we mostly used wood and a little tiny bit of coal. Then you can see that the use of coal progressed so we reduced the use of wood because coal was more efficient, more power. And then you can see the other forms of fossil fuels and energy that developed along the way. Um, but we're all using all of them still. And here you can see that renewables is this little orange line here. And so we can't expect that to replace the coal natural gas and oil that's on this chart. The reality is, at present, there is no replacement for fossil fuels. And you can see that in the era of climate diplomacy, global fossil fuel consumption has increased by 57 percent, and that was just up to 2017. And you can see that it would be impossible to go to net zero by 2050 because you would have to make all of these extra forms of power generation 
to replace this use of fossil fuels. But, of course, that's a trick because each one of these requires lots of fossil fuels to make any of it. So what's the statement by Secretary General Guterres all about? Well, it's about energy geopolitics. Fossil fuels are not evenly distributed worldwide. So here's where the coal deposits are. You can see that lots of countries don't have any coal. Here's where the crude oil reserves are. Lots of countries have little to none. Canada is third in the world. So of course, we're being targeted by geopolitical interests. Here this chart shows natural gas production and consumption. So you can see that Canada produces quite a bit more than it consumes, so we export. But you can see places like uh, Germany and Italy, they only consume it, so they have to import it. So, um, you know, as same with Japan, South Korea, Thailand, they have to import and they can't export because they don't have the natural resources there. Now, there's something that you may not have heard of called Made in China 2025. Uh, it's a plan by the Chinese uh, government to be the manufacturing center in the world for all of these things, for, um, for new information technology, numerical control tools, aerospace, high-tech, uh, railway, like high-speed rail, um, energy saving, um, new materials, that would be like specially designed new materials, um, medical devices, agricultural machinery, and power equipment. So for that, they're going to need all the energy and the rare earth minerals that they can get. And just to give you some context, of course, this is the amount of coal that China consumes. And remember how we're just so keen to phase out coal in Canada. We phased out coal in Alberta. And now the Canada Pension Plan is invested in coal in China. That's pretty depressing. So Guterres is misleading the public. Yes, how dare you, sir? And he said, today's IPCC Working Group 1 report is a code red for humanity. Well, that's simply not true. Because in that same report that he was talking about, the references to climate crisis or climate emergency only appear once in section 1, 2, 3, 4 of the Working Group 1 report on media coverage of climate change. The claimed climate crisis or emergency is a media and social phenomenon. It's not a scientific one. The 1.5 degrees Celsius target that we're always hearing about is a political and not a scientific goal. It's immoral and unethical for the IPCC and the UN, these hypocrites, to be flying all over the world to their climate conferences. This excerpt here is from John Broom, the IPCC's moral philosopher, and he states, to fight climate change, the IPCC finds it necessary to hold meetings in remote corners of the world. <laughs> and then he, he hopes that other authors offset the emissions caused by their travels to these meetings. I'm pleased to say the British government pays to offset mine. Well, I'm sure that there are... Uh, Many people in Canada who would like to know if the Canadian government is paying somebody to offset the many climate travels of our climate warriors in government. Someone should FOIP the government and find out. But notice here, uh, this is his recent statement, the fossil fuel industry is at the heart of the climate crisis. Countries must progressively phase them out and massively boost renewable investments. The planet can't wait. Well, as I just showed you, if you're going to boost renewables, then you have to use more oil, gas, and coal. And look who's a frequent flyer. There's a whole web page on Wikipedia that's dedicated to the flights that 
UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has made, and he's visited 84 countries. <laughs> Wish I had that pleasure. And here's the plane. So this is from Mark Morano over at Climate Depot. So totally a bunch of hypocrites. Now, what would life be like without fossil fuels? Well, here's two short excerpts that were written by Blair King, and I'm just going to read them to you because I think it's very frightening and enlightening. A thought experiment on what would happen if all fossil fuels disappeared tomorrow. In this thought experiment, experiment, we will assume a mystical power has arrived on Earth and using some unknown technology eliminated all fossil fuels. What would happen? Well, he lives in Langley, BC, that's like the lower mainland, which is a fairly temperate part of Canada. So he says, if you lived in the lower mainland, all transportation systems, except the SkyTrain and a few hundred electric vehicles, would immediately stop. Stores would cease to get new supplies, as all supplies are transported from warehouses by truck. No new supplies could get to the warehouses, as all the trains depend on diesel. Transport planes on aviation fuel and container ships on bunker oil or diesel. Soon the folks in the urban areas would be fighting over the remaining scraps in the stores, and once those supplies were gone, there would be nothing left to replace them. Within a couple of weeks, the city centers would look like a scene from The Walking Dead, with corpses everywhere as the weakest folks lost out in the battles for the gradually diminishing supplies of food and water. Absent the sanitary system, that means, you know, flush toilets and pumped water, because that would stop working within a very short period of time. The remaining folk would be fighting dysentery as human waste polluted the limited freshwater aquifers. Anyone with the capacity to do so would be moving away from the city centers as quickly as possible to forage as far as they could, roam by foot, and on the remaining bikes, the remaining electric vehicles having used their last charge after the electrical system failed. In the lower mainland, the city folk would be streaming out toward the valley, where they would discover that virtually everything edible, from plant to animal, had long since been eaten by the valley folk. Within a few months, over 90% of the population would have succumbed to the lack of clean water and food, leaving a small minority fighting it out over a few remaining crops. Come winter, absent fossil fuels, the remaining few would go back to burning wood for heat, and in doing so, they would add to the ecological devastation wrought by the first wave of city folk cleansing the ecosystem of everything edible. Certainly in parts of the developing world and in portions of the prairies, subsistence level communities might remain intact, but they would be rebuilding on a planet that had been systematically stripped of everything edible by the seven billion souls who did their best to survive and in doing so wrought an ecological apocalypse. In television shows like The Walking Dead, the zombie apocalypse addresses our population density before the millions of hungry humans have had a chance to devastate the planet. In a post-fossil fuel world, those seven billion souls would be fighting tooth and nail for every scrap of food and whatever large or mid-sized animals left behind would take hundreds of years to regenerate their populations and the ecosystem that came back would look a lot different from the ecosystem that existed before humans. Climate change may represent a real threat to humanity, but absent fossil fuels, it's likely that six billion or more people would pass away in the first six months in this post-fossil fuel world. So if you think about that, what, um, what Senior Antonio Guterres is actually advocating for is the death of millions of people. So there is no climate crisis. We just read 
that even in the science report, the working group one report of the IPCC, the only mention of climate crisis and climate emergency was related to media coverage. So what's he getting at? Is he trying to manipulate um, countries into some kind of self-destruction? Would that serve the interests of, you know, some other country or group of countries that want to be world dominant? Like who really owns the UN? Because the recommendations and demands that he's making obviously are deadly to millions of people. Um, and, you know, he's not in an elected position by us plebeians. He's just a spokesperson for a for the UN. UN that's supposed to be protecting human rights. He's a serial misleader, that's what he is. The UN chief says fossil fuels are incompatible with human survival. I just showed you that that's entirely false. He also then said um, back when the AR6 report was released that today's IPCC Working Group 1 report is a code red for humanity. That's not true. And a group of over 1,500 scientists and scholars under the umbrella of Clintel have sent a letter to Dr. Ho Sung Lee, who is the chair of the IPCC, calling out Antonio Guterres for making these kinds of public statements that were, of course, repeated around the world by the media. And uh, in their letter, they say the AR6 Working Group 1 report did not say these things. It never said it was a code red for humanity. Yet the IPCC never corrected him, Guterres, nor challenged any of the similarly inaccurate media coverage that distorts the contents of your report. So Clintel has issued their own review of the IPCC report and they found a lot of problems with the IPCC report. And um, in short, the IPCC seems obsessed with a few themes. The current warming is unique, or their favorite word, unprecedented. Climate change is all bad, and it's all caused by CO2. This attitude leads to tunnel vision. Therefore, we chose the title, The Frozen Climate Views of the IPCC. This doesn't mean that CO2 is not having any effect. Of course, it has, but the evidence that CO2 and other greenhouse gases are causing dangerous climate change is, even after 30 years and six major IPCC reports, rather thin. So they're also on thin ice, frozen on thin ice. If you like the work that we do, the information that we bring you, the insights we offer, please consider joining us. You can join online, you can become a member here, you can donate, you can send us a, an e-transfer if you like, contact at friendsofscience.org, and help us educate the public. If all you can do is share our material, that would be fantastic. So, uh, I hope you've enjoyed the, this short presentation. And uh, please continue to call out Antonio Guterres. Send him an email. Uh, tell your politicians about this. There's no climate emergency. There's no climate crisis. So um, it really stems from the fact that many of the scientific papers were using what's called uh, RCP 8.5, which is an implausible scenario. And it's only recently been found to, to have been um, proliferated through academia by the influence of a few green billionaires who, of course, are invested in carbon markets and renewables, both of which rely 100% on the claim that there's a climate crisis. So thanks very much for watching. And if you're looking for something to uh, read on different climate points of view, of course, read the Clintel report. But um, why not go back a couple of years and read our Climate Change Your Mind report? This was responding to the Canadian government's Canada's Changing Climate report. And um, all the material in it is still valid, still very interesting. 
uh, we think you might find it uh, of value. So thanks again for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling.